Good morning, everyone. We're reading The Magic of Aleister Crowley, but remember, this is the first edition many, many years ago, back in 1990-something, 1993. And if you had this first edition, I probably don't have to tell you that it fell apart quite easily. So I had mine spiral bound so I could use it as a in ritual and stuff. I could, it worked out fine. And everybody bought two of them. Anyway, here we are. We're talking about the second of the overtly Thelemic pentagram rituals of uh, the rituals of Thelema. That is Liber 5 Vel Reguli. And if you pronounce it Reguli, go ahead. I don't care. Now we come, oh, we're on page 86 of The Magic of Aleister Crowley. This will be a little challenging because there are, uh, uh, there are diagrams and uh, uh, figures that uh, are more easily, the text is more easily understood when you can hold up uh, little illustrations, but I'll do the best I, I can for a morning reading. Now we come to the Thelemic pentagram ritual about which there is considerable disagreement and controversy. Unthreateningly described as, quote, this is how Crowley describes it, an incantation proper to invoke the energies of the Aeon of Horus adapted for daily use of the magician of whatever grade. Unquote. Its ambiguities and mysteries nevertheless continue to challenge and intrigue students. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that wasn't always Crowley's intention anyway to keep us thinking about these things. But that was a digression. Sorry about that. Crowley's published comments on Reguli are sparse, so I have been fortunate to have been allowed access to Crowley's notes and several unpublished versions of the ritual, which have been helpful in writing this chapter. Crowley introduces Reguli as the, quote, ritual of the mark of the beast which to a great many people, especially those who think they understand the book of the Revelation of John, has a decidedly sinister ring to it. But as is usually the case with the nomenclature of Thelemic magic, the expressions that evoke fear and loathing in the hearts of the profane is revealed to the wise to be a profound and spiritually wholesome arcanum. To the Kabbalist, the mark of the beast, that's from Revelation, the book of the Revelation of John 13, 16. The mark of the beast is the New Testament development of the mark of Cain from the Old Testament, Genesis 4, 15, which, contrary to popular religious interpretation, is not the brand of a cursed sinner, but instead represents the radiant seal of illumination in the forehead of the initiate. Graphically, the mark of the beast is represented in its most simple form as the sun and moon united. And here I've just sketched out a flawless <laughs> illustration of the sun and moon conjoined, or the sun and moon uh, united. Crowley expanded that to include uh, two more sephira forming the supernal triad, like that. So if you look at that as the supernal triad with the, with the moon under the kether there, uh, and that kether there being also the sun, that's uh, the more elaborate mark of the beast. Also, I might have to point out to some of us, but it looks sort of like the bird's eye view 
of an erect phallus, if you're looking down from the top. I was going to say, do I have to draw you a picture? But I did. Okay. Um, graphically, the mark of the beast is represented in its most simple form as the sun and moon united, and among other things is the symbol of Babylon and the beast conjoined, and the great work accomplished. So, if if the right testicle was uh, the beast and the uh, left testicle was Babylon or Hokma and Bina or Shiva and Shakti, when they are united, they dissolve into bliss and become one or kether. It's a very cool symbol and it's very simple to, simple to draw with a wand just like that. It's a symbol of Babylon and the beast conjoined and their great work accomplished. Therefore, as an incantation proper to invoke the energies of the Aeon, the ritual of the mark of the beast, if properly executed, serves to rewire the psychic body of the magician to accommodate these higher spiritual energies. In fact, the overt employment of the various chakras as we'll see, makes reguli as much a yogic exercise as a ritual of ceremonial magic. While roughly adhering to the basic format of the pentagram rituals and the star ruby, there are some fundamental and drastic differences that distinguish Liber V, Vel Reguli. Some of these are obvious, others I feel uh, need to be addressed. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, as we'll, as we'll uh, see later on, we'll have the first gesture and the second gesture and stuff like that. The first gesture, the Kabbalistic cross opening found in the previous rituals, affirms the three columns of the Tree of Life. Uh, the middle pillar, Ate Malkuth, the pillar of severity, Vegebura, the pillar of mercy, Vegedula. In Reguli, this has been replaced by the, quote, vertical component of the enchantment, which affirms the middle pillar and the three horizontal components of the enchantment. the three horizontal ones. And look how the chakras are laid out there. And there's the, the divine names that are going to be used in this ritual. There uh, on the left show how those horizontal lines are attributed to these Thelemic concepts. So if I show you another drawing, that's the that's the old Kabbalistic cross that sort of gave us the the uh, the cross as we see darkened in this thing. But for Reguli, it's like that. It's the horizontal. That's now the vertical component. This one stresses the right and left. This one stresses the horizontal. And for people that are into different sort of heraldic crosses, that's the Hierophantic cross. That's called the Hierophantic cross. And that's the cross that, of the uh, Sovereign Grand Inspector General of the OTO, the Scottish Rite. Uh, they all have that cross. Okay. Uh, in Reguli, this has been replaced by the vertical components of the enchantment, which, which affirms the middle pillar and the three horizontal 
components of the enchantment, which affirms the three horizontal paths which join the pillar of severity to the pillar of mercy. Thus he shall formulate the sigil of the grand hierophant. Incorporation of the horizontal paths is perhaps the most notable innovation of Reguli and sets it apart fundamentally from all other rituals of the pentagram. This is especially significant in light of the fact that Crowley maintained that the Aeon of, o of Horus activated the path of Teth. The path of Teth is that second horizontal path on the Tree of Life. That's Teth. That's where you'd find the, the strength or the lust card in that where my finger is pointed. Right, right there. That horizontal one right there. Let's see. Uh, uh, Crowley maintained that the Aeon of Horus uh, activated the path of Teth, the path between Sephira, fifth Sephira Gebora and the fourth Sephira Hesed on the universal tree of life. Now, that doesn't mean that some light went on in some giant, vaporous, heavenly tree of life. But it's but it means that in the, the universal consciousness of humanity, uh, this new uh, stage uh, uh, represents uh, an awakening and the, or the possibility or the potential for awakening at that particular level of consciousness for humanity as a whole. Okay, so and also I've I'm going to show you that again. Now, in the course of the ritual, like like uh, you know, sort of corresponding to the Kabbalistic cross thing, where you say certain names and such. This is what you say at those horizontal things. Look, look to the left there. I was right at the top, joining two and three. Therian, uh, joining uh, 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 four and five. And Babylon, joining seven and eight. And you draw those on your body. And if you look to the uh, right there, you see which chakras those lines are being drawn uh, uh, over and in between. That's what I mean by this is almost a, no, this is a yogic exercise too. The second gesture. Like the lesser and greater rituals of the pentagram, the pentagrams and reguli are drawn in the air. But unlike any of the previous ceremonies, the pentagrams employed in Reguli are described as, quote, averse. Crowley was a master of the English language. And averse is a very curious word for him to use. What is an averse pentagram? I mean... Is that upright? Is that upright and that a verse? Upright. Where's my devil there? Oh, there he is. A verse. Okay, where are we? Where am I? Is it upside down? If so, inverted would be a much more accurate word. Is it upright with the elemental positions reversed? Unfortunately, Crowley published no precise instruction. 
or definition. In 1978, I asked Israel Rogardi what he thought Crowley meant. To my disappointment, he told me that he didn't know for certain, but he believed Crowley may simply wish to have sh to shock and outrage the members of the Golden Dawn whose fear of the inverted pentagram bordered on phobia. Regarde recommended that I use the traditional upright invoking pentagrams. Other Crowley experts have been even less helpful on the subject, suggesting everything from reversed upright pentagrams to upside down pentagrams formulated in the mind and hurled forth as in the star ruby. The dictionary defines a verse as turned away or backward. In botany, it refers to leaves that are turned away from the axis or main stem, as opposed to adverse, which the leaves are turned toward the axis. By this definition, we might conclude that two pentagrams, one upright and one inverted, joined horizontally at the axis of their bases, could both be considered a verse to each other. Like that. And as I'm going to say in just a moment, they'd even be side by side. Those two that are side by side are a verse to each other. Thank you, Crowley, for being so clear. Okay, uh, we could also conclude, though, with less conviction, that two upright pentagrams mirroring each other, right and left, are also a verse. Following the Kabbalistic axiom of polarities, we are negative to the plane above us and positive to the plane below us, we might wish to follow this line of reasoning a bit further. The two pentagrams with the horizontal axis, remember we're using horizontal axis in this uh, ritual, the two pentagrams with the horizontal axis could be projected upon the tree of life as shown in figure six. See? Granted, this arrangement leaves poor Malkuth dangling. A position not without Kabbalistic precedent. But everything else fits quite nicely. Using the path of Teth as the base, as the baseline, all three horizontal paths so important to Liber Reguli are represented. Also note the two tetrahedrons formed by this arrangement. Okay, there, there we are. Now we're projecting them on a tree for Avers to each other like that. And when we put them like that, they form two tetrahedrons and two versions of the Thelemic unicursal hexagram. Another method is to project all four Averse pentagrams upon the Tree of Life, as I just showed you. Here we see the path of Teth is unique among the three horizontal paths. Like a looking glass, it is the point of reflection, the pivotal axis to all four A-verse pentagrams. Let me take a look one more time. Once the four are superimposed upon the tree, we discover that they form a double version of Crowley's unicursal 
hexagram, the hexagram of the beast is what he calls it, which is traced uh, in line 20 of the second gesture of Liber Reguli, which we'll see in a moment. The student wishing to pursue this line of speculation further can further construct pentagrams based on the universe card of, uh, uh, or the five of discs from Crowley's Stoth Tarot or the elemental format of those used in the greater pentagram uh, ritual or projecting the pentagrams upon the tree of life according to elemental rulership of the Sephiroth. Viewed in relation to other Thelemic rituals, especially the star Sapphire, which is the hexagram ritual coming up, there are even subtler and more complex considerations to be weighed, weighed including the concept of employing the NOx formula to access an averse or reversed tree of life. Speculation on this matter could continue indefinitely, and I'm not at all sure that wasn't Crowley's intention. Over the last 20 years, as my understanding and appreciation of Thelemic rituals has grown, my opinion on this subject has changed at least a dozen times. Confusion over this point, however, did not prevent me from learning the ritual and working with it on a daily basis. It is only by working with the rituals that any significant degree of understanding can develop. If you wait until you're positive, you understand all spec aspects of a ceremony before begin, beginning to work, you'll never begin to work. All conjecture aside, okay, there's a, there's a punchline to this, everyone, if you're still with me. All conjuncture aside, the whole question of the A-verse pentagram seems to have finally been put to rest by a manuscript bearing Crowley's handwritten notes and drawings recently found at the George Arendt's Research Library at Syracuse University. This typescript, whose provenance has been tentatively attributed to 1928, includes the entire text of Liber uh, V. Vel Reguli, complete with drawings of the various pentagrams and symbols. It reveals without ambiguity, that the Averse pentagram is simply the standard pentagram turned upside down. Now, if I would turn this drawing right there, if I turn it upside down, all the elements would be in their proper place. Okay. We got our, our fire, well, when I do that, it, it even, <laughs> any, anyway, with an upright pentagram, we've got uh, spirit at the top, uh, fire at the lower right, water at the upper right, air at the upper left, and earth at the lower left, okay? That's where we have those, the lion and the bull and the, the eagle and the angel. Okay. The Averse pentagram leaves those attributes attached to those points. Okay. Doesn't change them. And just turns the thing upside down. Okay. So as you're drawing an Averse pentagram, okay, you don't have to worry about switching the positions of any of those, those quarters. You just have to, in your brain, know that it's all upside down. It reveals without ambiguity that the Averse pentagram is simply the standard pentagram turned upside down. The elements remain in their same positions and directions for invoking and banishing are exactly as they would be if you drew a standard upright pentagram on a piece of paper and then simply turned the paper upside down. 
Now we know for certain what the Avers pentagrams are, but why do we use them? A clue to our answer might be found in Regulai's unique positioning of the four fixed signs of the zodiac in the circle that we're using. Traditionally, the zodiac is thought of as a belt on the 12 constellations or signs through which the sun passes from the Earth's point of view uh, in a counterclockwise yearly journey. We could make a traditional magical circle of the zodiacal belt by placing Taurus in the east, Leo in the north, Scorpio in the west, and Aquarius in the south. Just like that diagram right there. See the magician standing on his head? And there's the zodiac running counterclockwise, as we often think of it in astrology. As we will see in Reguli, however, this is not the case. Taurus is still in the east, Scorpio still in the, in the west, but the positions of Leo and Aquarius are reversed. In other words, for this ritual, the signs of the zodiac are now running clockwise. Has Crowley turned the belt of the zodiac upside down? No. He's turned the magician upside down. As I've mentioned earlier, in Thelemic rituals of the pentagram, the magician no longer thinks of himself or herself as standing upon the surface of the earth, or geocentric, but rather identifies with the sun, heliocentric. From the sun's point of view, there is no up or down. In order to help liberate the magician from the old Aeon illusion of restricted orientation, Crowley now positions us upside down in the center of the zodiacal belt. In this position, the zodiac now appears to run clockwise, and from the point of view of the macrocosmic uh, orientation. Pentagrams we would draw from this position are naturally a verse. If it were possible for you to actually perform Libra uh, 5 Vel Reguli while standing on your head, then from your upside down point of view, the zodiac would run counterclockwise and the pentagrams would be upright. Perhaps for some, the Averse pentagram will continue to be the frightful symbol of triumph of matter over spirit, as the aspirants of the Golden Dawn are warned. In Reguli, however, it is not a case of matter triumphing over spirit, but rather it is a case of spirit descending into matter. I have incorporated Crowley's notes and drawings from the above-mentioned manuscript in the text of Liber Reguli that follows. I have also included, as footnotes, his comments from another manuscript. My own comments as editor are identified as such. And that's where we'll leave it today. Tomorrow we will begin discussing and actually reading through Libra 5, Vel Reguli. Being a ritual of the mark of the beast, an incantation proper to evoke, invoke the energies of the Aeon of Horus, adapted for the daily use of the magician of any grade. And that's it for today. Uh, I'd like to remind you, if you haven't registered for Wednesday's uh, uh, thing on the Holy Guardian Angel, please do so today. Uh, uh, if you wait to the last minute, uh, the same people that process uh, your registration are those that are preparing for the, the event itself. 
and uh, the people that uh, attempt to register at the last minute uh, uh, occasionally don't make don't make it in. So, if you are interested in the Holy Guardian Angel uh, and uh, my perspective on that, it's Wednesday night at seven o'clock. It's a Zoom presentation. Uh, it's an hour long. It's probably closer to 90 minutes long. Uh, and uh, everyone who registers will uh, also get a link to replay it any time that they want. So that being said, let's continue on with our week. Continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.